agenda. So I think that there is very much a lot of work that needs to be done. But in this moment, I also very much celebrate all the work that different women in their respective fields are doing and very much also um, our speakers that are here today. I welcome you all. I welcome the all our speakers. You are most welcome. You are our guest of honor for today and also to the council, Rhodes University, SRC, to each and every single person that is joining us from their respective homes. We very much welcome you to this Women's Day event. Welcome and welcome to you all. And I hope that you all feel welcome and you take something from today that we have a very fruitful session. I'd also just like to remind everyone that we please, please observe um, Zoom protocol as we all know to please keep ourselves muted um, in, at all times when the speakers are speaking so that we can avoid any form of disturbances. And also, um, that you will be allowed as a speaker to unmute yourself when you have to speak. This is to all our speakers. And please also switch on your video when it is your chance to speak. How it will work is that I will then um, welcome the speaker, read their bio, and they will continue to speak. Welcome to you all. I'd like to give over to our technical team that will be playing a poem for us before we start. Thank you. Moons and lights. You may write me down in history with your bitter twisted lines. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still like dust. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Just cause I walk as if I have oil wells pumping in my living room. <laughs> Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of tides. Just like hope springing high, still I ride. Did you want to see me broken? Bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops weakened by my soulful cry. Does my sassiness upset you? <laughs> Don't take it so hard just cause I laugh as if I have gold mines digging in my own backyard. You can shoot me with your words. You can cut me with your lies. You can kill me with your hatefulness, but just like life, I rise. Does my sexiness offend you? Oh. Does it come as a surprise that I dance? As if I have diamonds at the meeting of my thighs. <laughs> Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past rooted in pain, I rise. A black ocean leaping and wide, welling and swelling and bearing in the Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I ride into a daybreak miraculously clear, I ride. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the hope and the dream of the slave and so. Thank you very much to our technical team for that wonderful poem, Still I Rise. And even today, still we continue to rise. Thank you so much. I will now officially start our event with our guest speaker, who is Kiran O'Connor. She is a final year um, fine arts student 
who has um, led in Goli Fasi for the past two years. She has been involved in activism against gender-based violence within the university and at a national level, as well as advocating for queer rights. Kirin has also been heavily involved in student governance in various roles throughout her university. Thank you so much, Kirin, for joining us and over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Madam President, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you so much for having me here today. Um, all right, so let's get going with it. So I want to start off with asking you, when was the last time you saw an openly queer character on screen? Think about how they were portrayed. Were they a stereotype? How many queer artists do you know, or activists, or academics, or politicians, or musicians? You know, the list kind of goes on and on. I'm asking you this because I want you to keep these in mind as we go throughout this brief discussion. So if you didn't know, today I'm talking about issues in queer representation. Before we get going, um, just a little bit about me. In addition to what uh, Madam President has introduced, um, I am proudly pansexual. Um, my pronouns are she, her. Um, and yeah, so in addition to queer rights and anti-GBV activism, um, I do other activism in terms of mental health issues and uh, fighting for women's rights. Um, but that's all that's really relevant to this discussion today. So I'm just gonna move on. So just some housekeeping and disclaimers. First of all, a major trigger warning for various forms of queer phobia and possible mentions of violence against the queer community. Um, again, uh, so I am a cisgender white pansexual woman. So that means that my experiences and my views are quite limited because of these identities. So if I say something about a different community and it may not be correct, and you're part of that community, please let me know, um, correct me. Uh, you know better than I do. I'm working off of information that I've gotten from elsewhere. Um, and if you're talking to someone that's part of these communities and they're telling you that actually no, that isn't correct, or they hold a different viewpoint, please listen to them. Um, again, my viewpoint's very limited. Uh, so please keep that in mind as well. Um, so I'll be using the term queer in place of or interchangeably with the generic acronym, so LGBTQ+, and that's just a personal preference of mine. Uh, some people find the term queer offensive still. Um, personally, I don't like using the acronym for various reasons that I won't get into right now, um, but I'm just saying, you know, that's a term that I'll be using. Uh, I also won't be defining all of the various identities in the community. If you do have questions about the terms that I'm using, either leave a message in the comment, leave a message, um, or Google is your friend. Just if you've got questions about, you know, the basics, please just Google it. And then um, I'll be focusing mainly on representation in film and TV. So, rates of queer people seem to be rising. Some say it's all, it's because it's all made up and it's just a, it's a trend, you know, made up by the youngsters. Everyone just wants to be trendy and hippie. But it's because we're finally living in a world where we can be who we are. You know, so we do have more people that are out now than a hundred years ago. But we're also living in a completely different world to what we were living in a hundred years ago. And we've made a lot of progress since then. Well, yes. We have, we have, but also we haven't at the same time because we are still suffering from queer phobia. We're still suffering violence. I mean, for goodness sake, South Africa was only the fifth country in the world to legalize same-sex marriage in 2006. So the movement for queer rights hasn't really made a lot of progress since you know the past like 20 years. And we've been fighting since way before then. We're also still the only country in Africa to have legalized same-sex marriage. And there are still countries in Africa and in the world in general where you can be killed for being gay, for being queer in any form. So please also keep that in mind. You know, things are finally changing. And that means we can't do what's always being done. We need to be groundbreakers. We need to push. 
You need to look at what has been done, thank them and carry on. Start making our own way. So if we look at some stats, and this is US stats because there is not a lot of uh, stats in terms of how, in terms of South Africa. So these are um, American stats. So approximately 4.5% of the US population is queer. That's approximately because that's only a portion that are willing to you know, be out and admit that they are queer. There are plenty of people that are still closeted. And according to a 2020 report, approximately 6.7% of the top 10 recurring characters in TV shows are queer. And I think that's quite a good statistic. Um, and then out of the top 300 shows studied, 26% uh, had at least one queer cast member. And again, that's, that's decent, you know, that's decent. But there's still more that can be done. There's more that we can push for, especially if we look at the types of representation in those statistics. We see that it's mostly um, white queer men. Um, in general, it's mostly white people that are represented. Um, queer people of color are heavily underrepresented in film and television, um, specifically queer women of color. So that's where we need to be pushing particularly. Um, again, those are just US stats and that doesn't really represent South Africa, but it kind of gives you an idea of what we're working with in terms of mainstream film and television. There's a saying that there's no such thing as bad publicity, but unfortunately for queer folk there is because there are plenty of people that like to use stories in general. So we're talking novels, we're talking film and television. They like to use stories as a justification for their hate. At this point in time, there does seem to be a particular target um, with plenty of books and stories coming out, trying to target um, trans women and trying to portray them in a really negative light to justify their transphobia. So be aware when seeing these kinds of stories that it may just be a transphobe trying to justify their hate. Not all representation is good representation. For a long time, we kind of just took what we could get. We were just happy to see a queer character on a show. Doesn't matter about their representation, or at least that's what we were told. We're told you just need to be happy about the fact that there is a queer character. But now we need to have standards and we do have standards. We want better representation for our community. We deserve better representation. So some forms of representation are offensive or inaccurate because they're written or performed by someone from outside the community. That's the biggest issue is often when people from outside the queer community try and take these roles and think that they know what they're doing and they end up just veering way off course and everyone's like, whoa, whoa. Another issue is that a lot of people use cis gay men as a means to represent the entire community thinking that that's all we are. And that's not the truth. We are way more complex than that. We have all of our various identities that have their various cultures from all of our various experiences, but we are still one queer community. So I think it would be useful to have a look at some good and bad examples of queer representation in film and TV. Firstly, I'd like to talk about the FX series Pose which is a good example for queer and specifically trans representation in TV. So it's a drama set in 80s New York and it focuses on the underground ballroom scene, which was a gathering place for queer people of color. Uh, the story focuses on a group of queer people uh, who are rejected by mainstream society and they find family within their community. Uh, it fills a gap that's still present in stories about trans women of color and people living with HIV and AIDS. And especially because this is set in 80s New York, this is at the height of the AIDS epidemic, um, which heavily affected the queer community um, and still isn't really spoken about. So the show is very important in terms of showing these stories, broadcasting it to the world, because these are the people that did not have a voice at this time, especially because they're often living in poverty, they're sex workers, 
things like that. So it's very important that these stories are shared. So majority of the main recurring characters are trans women, which is a rarity these days in representation. And it's one of the things that makes this show so groundbreaking. It also doesn't shy away from the hard truths of living as queer at that time. Just talking about homelessness, um, again, having to resort to sex work to get by, looking at living in poverty, um, looking at violence against queer people and trans women um, in particular. Um, and some of these stories do still ring true today, like 40 years later. I think my maths isn't good. <laughs> um, the show was created to be a show that all the queers would have watched growing up. This is something that many people wish they had. Another important thing about this show, it's vital, is they cast trans actors in trans roles, which means that the roles were more accurate, they were portrayed more accurately. It allowed trans people to better portray their experiences in these roles. It comes across, it makes a difference. A cis person cannot fully and accurately play a trans person. This is something we need more in film and TV, is we need more queer people playing queer characters. It just, it makes for better, it, it makes for better roles, personally. And then another thing that's groundbreaking about the show is MJ Rodriguez, who plays the main character, Blanca. She's just been nominated for an Emmy in Best Actress category, which makes her the first trans person ever to be nominated in a lead acting category for Emmys and is only the third trans person ever to be nominated for an Emmy. So that's fantastic. The wonderful thing about this show is that it tells stories of underrepresented people um, whose stories are often, you know, told with just complete lack of empathy. And the show handles it very well. Um, it handles it with empathy and understanding and makes, the, makes it relatable. Personally, I cried when I watched this show because, again, it doesn't shy away from those nitty gritty bits and shows you the reality of what happens. It gave me a greater understanding of what trans and queer people of color still go through because a lot of these things do still ring true. I also see it as a means of reclaiming the transness of ball culture in general, and it's which has heavily influenced modern queer culture, which is going to get us onto what I was talking about next, which is RuPaul's Drag Race. <laughs> um, I would say this is probably the most influential piece of queer media in our current time. It's become an expectation that us queer people watch it, and yes, I do watch it. Um, it's also become an assumption that that is what queer culture is. You know, that we all go yas queen and work and whatever. And yes, that some people do do that, but there are other people that really don't want anything to do with that. It's heavily influenced mainstream queer culture and proves that our culture is still dominated by mainly cis gay men. It's an example of good and bad representation. So go through it. So it's good representation in that it shows that queerness can be financially successful. It can be monetized, which in this day and age is kind of a good thing um, because it shows that we can do these things about it. They are gonna be successful. You can invest in queerness, it's possible. It gives queer performers a wider platform for recognition and success. So these queens that are working their best to try and get by these people that are often targeted. They are also living in poverty a lot of the time. So it gives them a platform for success. Um, it also gives an opportunity to educate non-queer people about queer issues in a more palatable format. It's not, it's not an occasion like this where we're directly talking to you and like, this is what you must do. It's, you know, here's this challenge and it highlights these things or, oh, this queen on the runway, she's wearing a dress that makes a statement, that kind of thing. Um, but then we move on to some of the bad aspects of it. So first of all, it is mainly dominated by cis gay men um, and the, it doesn't represent the demographic that actually exists in terms of real world drag culture. 
Um, you have a way wider demographic of queens, you have trans queens, you have drag kings who aren't represented on the show. It took nearly, <laughs> I mean, they only had their first trans mask drag queen in season 13, which was last year. This show has been going since 2009. So it's taken a way too long of a time. And a lot of the queens that are trans femme that got onto the show, honestly, a lot of them aren't cast because they're trans femme or knowing that they're trans femme, they're cast thinking that they're cis gay men, which is completely horrible. Um, but it's the demographic just, it doesn't show um, the true nature of what drag culture really is. Um, it poses elements stolen from ballroom culture. So if we're looking at pose, that kind of culture, um, it's that's not drag culture, that's ballroom culture and has particular elements to it. And Drag Race has stolen some of that and made it drag culture and then made it queer culture and taken away the transness and the fact that it came from people of color, people that are heavily marginalized in society, even within the queer culture. Um, and that, that's a huge issue. It also feeds into several stereotypes about gay men and it pushes this culture as queer culture. So those are my major issues with that. Um, next, I'm going to be talking about Disclosure and it is a documentary focused on trans representation in film and TV. I would highly recommend this documentary for anyone interested in trans representation. Um, it traces the history of trans representation in Hollywood and how representation is linked to societal beliefs and the actual trans realities. What's great about this is that they use um, an interview format with trans thinkers and creatives. And so it is heavily informed by trans realities. You know, you have people that are talking about what they are experiencing, which is so important in representation these days, you need it to come from the horse's mouth. And that's why earlier I was also saying that, you know, these are my identities, I'm speaking from a limited perspective. So if you want to know more, either go like, ask someone who is willing to talk about it, or go and watch these things that are from trans people. Um, so that's what we need, we need to be prioritizing trans people in their own representation and queer people in their own representation. Um, this documentary was created during Trump era America, where there was a need for better understanding and for greater presence of trans people in general, as a whole bunch of things were coming out, attacking trans people for being who they are. Apparently, approximately 80% of the US population has not met a trans person. All they have is media representation. And so this documentary is aimed at the 80% of people who haven't met a trans person and to give them a better understanding of the fact that some of these pieces of media that they're consuming aren't accurate. So queer representation in film and TV, it often focuses on the trauma that us queer folks suffer rather than our successes. It can be really, really depressing for us queer people to have to watch all of these stories about how hated we are in society. And it's often really, really traumatizing. You know, you have great shows like Pose, but I know plenty of trans people that can't watch Pose, that can't watch Disclosure because they don't have the energy to go through that trauma again. So what I think we need is we, we need more content that is talking about how we can be successful, how we can be happy in life. Because all we're hearing is about how we're never going to be happy, we're going to suffer, we're going to be hunted down, those kinds of things. And it's, it's horrible, terrific. Um, so although those types of stories, they try and appeal, they, they do appeal more to queer folk because those are our stories. Um, but we do need more people that are outside of the community to start engaging with this content um, and start looking at it as a way to understand our community better. Next, I just wanted to talk briefly about the lack of queerness in children's media. And that comes from the idea that queerness is inherently very sexual. 
um, and therefore inappropriate for children. You know, don't talk about it. It's not okay. You know, the children, they don't need to know, but they do need to know. Children need to know what this is because you don't know if your child is going to be straight, always going to be queer, always going to be trans or even asexual, aromantic. It's not inherently sexual. It's an identity. It's, it's part of who we are. And depriving children about learning about queerness, it has various consequences. One of them being that it could cause immense amounts of trauma for the child. Um, there are a lot of people, who, a lot of the people that I know who knew that they were queer from an early age. It really helped them understand themselves growing up. But people like me who only discovered that we were queer in, you know, our 20s, it feels like a part of our development is gone. I didn't have the opportunity to explore my queerness in, in my adolescence, in my childhood, you know, to understand that I don't have to feel shame for being who I am. Growing up feeling shameful and repressing all of these memories. That's the thing that a lot of people don't talk about actually is that repressing queerness can also lead to memory loss. So I don't have a lot of memories of my childhood, probably for other reasons as well, but I do think part of it is because I was repressing this queerness within me. So, you know, we need to be talking to children about queerness. A good example is Blue's Clues, um, a children's show, um, which started, you know, back when I was a child and is still going today. They, I think it was this year for Pride, they had a Pride alphabet parade and showed different types of families and these all those kinds of things. Um, and that was a wonderful example and it was so adorable and I implore all of you to really go look it up. It's fantastic. A bad example, Disney, just Disney. <laughs> they shy away from using the word gay, queer, trans, whatever. They allude to all of these characters I mean, for flip sakes, they've got a they got a movie coming out, Jungle Cruise, and Jack Whitehall's playing a gay character, and he admits that he's gay, and it's this big thing. Oh, first openly like gay character, like properly, except he never says the word gay. He just says, "My interests lie elsewhere." I don't know what it is, but Disney really don't want to be associated with queerness, even though so many queer people resonate with so many Disney stories. So then going on to quickly South African queer content. Um, South Africa, again, is still the only African country to legalize same-sex marriage. And we've been a front runner in legal rights for the queer community in the world in general. However, our public attitude towards queerness doesn't actually match our legal representation and our rights. Because the, we still live in an intensely queer phobic culture that meets queerness with violence, intense violence. And we've seen that rising recently. It's a real, real problem. We can see that in queer representation in South African media. It's often about homophobia or includes some aspect of homophobia in South Africa that is usually violent. Either it's um, current South Africa or past South Africa. Either way, it's usually these violent stories that are really traumatizing we don't have a lot of happy stories. And when we do have representation in TV in particular, it seems to be that queer representation is in the form of stereotyped gay men, which is a real problem because we are more than that. Um, the other issue in representation in general, and I think this is relevant to today's conversation, is that queer issues are often excluded from anti-GBV conversations. And many of these, so th those conversations and the issues that are spoken about are often spoken about in a very cisgendered way. Um, so talking about women's issues, to often talking about cis women's issues. We don't include trans women's issues in anti-GBV talks or in women's rights talks because we, we need to be including them. They are women and they do, they do have different issues to us, but they also have some of the same issues as us. So we need to be including queer people in general in this representation, especially in anti-GBV conversations, because we also suffer violence because of who we are. So that's something that I'd like to put out there um, 
So all of you anti-GBV activists, please remember to include queer people in your activism. That is a form of representation that we desperately need right now. So a lot of those, again, yeah, a lot of those conversations about violence are about cis women's um, experiences. So kind of where do we go from here? I'd like to see more South African content tackling being queer in Africa and its complexities. Talking about queerness in Africa is a big deal because a lot of people say that queerness is not African, which is a total lie. Um, I'd like to see more happy stories, more things that are uplifting to our community, telling us that we have a chance. We have a chance to survive. We have a chance to have a happy life. I don't think people realize how draining it is to constantly be reminded how much we are hated and how much some of our friends and our family are hated by the society that we live in. We also need more queer people in front of and behind the camera. It changes the tone of the content and how people respond to it. It really does make a difference, I promise you. There are many, many more examples that I could talk about but I don't have the time for that. And I'd like to encourage you to go and do your own research. Google is your friend, I promise. Go and find content, good content, that queer people resonate with. Ask your friends, go onto Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, see what people are talking about. It can be really tiring for us to have to educate people constantly. So please go do your own research if you have a lot of questions, a lot of us, find out a lot of these things about our own community from Google. So Google can tell you a lot of other things that we can't. Um, we can tell you from our personal experiences, but Google is your friend. Yes, so thank you so much for listening to me. Thank you so much to the SRC for inviting me here today. Um, I hope this was an informative talk. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can, uh, Instagram DM or email um, Nkoli Fasi, which is N-K-O-L-I dash F-A-S-S-I-E, um, then at gmail.com. Um, actually, no, that's not our email address, <laughs> but that is our Instagram. You can find our email address there. Um, yes, I hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. And yes, have a lovely, lovely Women's Day. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kieran. That was absolutely amazing. I mean, just from everything that you've said, I feel so like it was so, so informative. I've actually learned so much and more so having to think about where do we go from here in terms of queer representation, because it is needed even more so in the times when we are um, finding ourselves in Women's Month to also think about um, each and every single issue, intersectional issues um, that queer women face. And I think it's so, so important that you brought that to the conversation of Women's Month. Thank you so much. I will now move on to our next speaker which is Rosanne Kruger. Rosanne Kruger is a le lectures constitutional law to LLB final year and legal theory to students. She was appointed at Rhodes University in 2001. Her term as Dean of Faculty commenced in July, 2014 and ended in July, 2020. Her research for a PhD considered the application of the Promotion of Equality and Prevention of Unfair Discrimination Act 4 of 2000. Of 2000. At the level of magistrates courts with um, specific reference to complaints on ra of racism. She continues to work on discrimination law and its impact on social change. Rosanne's other research interests include constitutional law theory and constitutional litigation. I mean, what a profound bio. I feel like I'm now, so, you know, a very well articulated um, law student. <laughs> Over to you, Ms. Rosanne Kruger. And thank you so much for um, joining us here today to speak on the topic of women in law. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, um, Liu Hang, for the invitation in, and particularly to uh, Tonga. Um, um, yes, I am. Um, I think I'm, to some extent I'm going to pick up on where Kieran left off or, or she spoke a lot about stereotype and um, 
And in typical lawyer's fashion, I am going to um, take my brief fairly literally. My brief was challenges and inspiration. So let me start <laughs> by taking my literal interpretation of the, um, and start with challenges. Um, and I'm going to start with, I think, what is typically, um, perhaps let me take two steps back, if I may. I'm talking about women entering in the legal profession and, and what possible challenges women may face. And then also trying to give a word of advice for someone who is aspiring to um, enter into the legal profession at some point in their lives, women in particular. Um, so Kieran spoke about stereotypes and I want to pick up on stereotypes because I think for the greater part, when we talk about one of the barriers, one of the challenges that a woman would face entering the legal profession is that the answer would simply be, but it's a man's job. Um, I don't know whether many of you, you can entertain yourself um, and probably freak yourself out um, by reading a 1918 decision of our South African courts where a woman by the name of Miss Wookie wanted to be admitted as a legal practitioner and they said it's just not suitable for a woman to be a legal practitioner because I mean the, the consist you know the, the the makeup of a woman is just too fragile for this kind of business so unfortunately and I, I mean I think I can say fortunately we are we are way beyond 1918 but um, there's still this idea that the law is shaped by men and that um, it's a man's world and it's a man's job and that women who would like to succeed in law need to be a little bit mannish, if I can say something like that. I don't know whether that is appropriate or inappropriate. Correct me if I'm wrong. But you have to be a little bit of a, a fighter if you want to succeed. And, and that's not necessarily true. I think um, what is important is to remember that there are gender stereotypes and that one, if you are entering into that arena as a legal practitioner or as a legal academic and legal academia is for the greater part seen as appropriate for women because you know it's sort of a little bit tamer than practitioners who fight and litigate and engage in hard conversations and that is also not true because in in all different aspects of law you have to be able to confront difficult conversations and to to have the tough um commitment to succeed in, in your job. So, and that doesn't necessarily come with being a man or a woman um, with a gender stereotype that goes with that, but it goes to what is your interest and what you want to do with your life. So gender stereotypes most certainly exist. And if you look beyond um, say the academy and you look to legal profession, you will see that many of our um, main law firms, the people who head up those firms are men. The most directors are men, and they're typically white men. But um, that does not necessarily mean that it has to stay like that. So beyond the, the stereotype that poses a challenge for women that they have to question and keep questioning, um, there's also the second um, a challenge which I've identified, which I think is something that as women, everyone and men, we have to confront. And that is the challenge of work-life work balance. And I don't know how many of you have um, perhaps children of your own or you have um, siblings, young siblings, and you have seen what COVID lockdown has done in respect of looking after children. Because for the greater part, there is still the stereotype that others must look after children. And if children are not in school, very often the main person being responsible for doing the homeschooling is mom. And that, to some extent, also poses a challenge to women wanting to progress in the legal profession, particularly when it comes to more senior positions, because of the particular dynamics in the particular family. And once again, that's a stereotype in itself and a stereotype that one has to challenge because the fact that a woman chooses to have children does not necessarily mean that her career is less important or less significant 
than her partner's career because both parents have similar or same responsibility in respect of um, the raising of their children. But that is something that one has to bear in mind as a barrier for women progressing in the legal profession. And then there's the other nasty one, and that is sexual harassment. And fairly recently, I've heard about sexual harassment in the legal profession again, where women, particularly young women, who enter the legal profession are subjected to very explicit sexual harassment and almost um, made to, to realize that um, if they want to get somewhere, there will have to be some quid pro quo. And um, that is something that needs to be exposed. People have to be held accountable because it is completely unacceptable that um, in any workplace, but I think particularly in a workplace where we try to say that what we are about is we are about rights, we're about empowering people, we're about, um, you know, seeing that justice is done, that um, people in this um, profession uh, uh, prey on particularly young women who are entering the profession and um, in some instances they succeed and with the with the um, predatory behavior and very often those young women choose to leave the profession and they pursue other endeavors in life and I think it is important for us for everyone in every workplace but particularly for women in law to speak out about these things and I know that it's hard because if you want to get somewhere, you have to put in hours and the hours mean that you have to make sacrifices. But I think um, when it comes to things like sexual harassment, I think it is something that is completely unacceptable and that should be rooted out of any professional environment. So those are, um, I think, barriers that women um, wishing to enter the legal profession must keep in mind that um, there are stereotypes, there are challenges when it comes to finding balance between your work and your life, and that sexual harassment is unfortunately a reality in many of the places where you will find yourself working, whether that is in a litigation or whether that is in, in your own law firm. But those are things that one should really root out um, completely. And then, and I'm going to keep it fairly brief because I would like to hear what young women have to say about what they find challenging and what they find um, gives them some hope for being able to make future of to make a future in the legal profession because I can tell you I find it really rewarding in in the different roles that I've played in the last 20 odd years that I've been working in this profession um, I think that one of the things that I would encourage everyone is to to set yourself some goals but I think you should have a serious conversation with yourself about what it is that you want to achieve in the sense that don't let someone else tell you that you have to work at the one of the big five law firms and that's the only measure of success of your life. That's not the measure of success of your life. The measure of success of your life is what you set out to be what you choose to be. We need people to work in small law firms. We need people to work as prosecutors. We need competent legal advisors in the state. So choose your passion and follow your passion. That's one of the things that I really would like to encourage all of you to do. And, and, and very particularly, um, one of the things is, if you want to be a teacher in your hearts of hearts, but your mother or your father tells you that you really have to pursue a career in law. I really would like to encourage you to become a teacher because or uh, whatever it is that you want to be doing. Um, it's very important that you have to want to do something in order to be successful. And then I think it speaks for itself and I'm going to have to say it is you have to work hard. Um, in order to be successful, you unfortunately or fortunately, it depends on how you feel about work, but you have to put in the time and the commitment um, in order to be successful in what you are setting out to do. 
And whether that is as a student or whether that is as a practitioner or whether that is as a lawyer in uh, providing legal advice, you have to be, and it's not, I'm not saying that women have to work harder, but sometimes it is women have to work harder because you are either not taken seriously, but you can make yourself be taken seriously by being the strong woman that you are. And I would encourage everyone to not think that no one's going to come to you and knock on your door and say, would you like to do X or Y? You have to go out and find the opportunities. And I, I think the, the reality is that it is very seldom that something falls into your lap. You have to proactively go out and look for it and you have to work at whatever it is that you're doing. If you're doing your first year, if you're doing your final year, you have to work hard in order to be able to get somewhere and to achieve. And then in the, the next thing that I would like to encourage you to do is also to find balance because I think one of the things that um, is important is that you can't just work. You have to work hard, but you have to find balance. And if your balance, you find it in doing sport or you find it in reading or pursuing whatever other hobbies you have, you have to find balance in your life. And it also includes that you have to look after your physical body and your mental health. And the way in which you know yourself best is the way in which you have to do that. If it means that you have to meditate, if it means that you have to attend a religious service of sorts, you have to do what is in the interest of your mental health on the one hand and your physical health on the other hand. And, and I have to say, I, I think I was way older than city when I actually for the first time realized how important it was to um, uh, to uh, look after your physical health uh, too um, because unfortunately um, that doesn't carry on forever you don't stay 20 um, your body ages and you have to look after it and um, keep something do some sport go for a walk um, work in the garden, do something that you find interesting and in, 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 in that, um, but to look after your physical body too. And then I think going with finding balance and I'm, uh, Tinasha, I'll go to your question now because this is pretty much the last point that I want to make is that I would like to encourage you also to be kind to yourself because I think very often um, women are very self-critical, more so than men, I think. Um, and this is, now listen to me stereotyping, but I think women are very often quite um, harsh on themselves and set high standards. And then when they don't achieve those standards, they are very good at beating themselves up. And that is not healthy and it doesn't solve the challenge or the problem that you were facing in the first instance. I think it is important to acknowledge in some instances that you're not going to be on top of the world 24 seven. You need to acknowledge that in some instances you are going to drop the ball. And once you've dropped the ball, give yourself a break. Just acknowledge that these things happen. Um, one doesn't have to be a champion or a superwoman all the time. You are entitled to have time where you can do what you want to do and look after yourself in the way in which you choose to do that. I mean, people have different ways of relaxing, people have different ways of self-care. And I would encourage you to figure it out if you haven't figured it out, what it is that makes you or that gives you courage. Um, Tinashe, let me just see here. Uh, seeing that we are able to acknowledge the injustices women face, how do we move forward? What does the future look like to ensure that women are not subjected to sexual harassment? Uh, I think what, the, the, to stop sexual harassment, I think the most important thing is for people to speak out because unless we see it and unless we acknowledge it, that it exists and it's not good enough. And I mean, it sounds terrible to say it's not good enough to just 
as speaking in the corridors, acknowledging that sexual harassment takes place. But it needs to be reported as misconduct to the Legal Practice Council. It needs to be reported so that action can be taken against whatever senior official there is, that action can be taken against that person because it is completely unacceptable. Um, and once again, it, it seems almost as if one is, if, if I'm saying, but the responsibility is on women. The responsibility is on everyone. But the responsibility is, I would imagine, also very particularly on senior women in the legal profession to take a, a leading role and to speak out whenever they see that young women are subjected to sexual harassment. Because, but unfortunately, as you well know, these things don't necessarily happen always out in the open. It happens where no one can see it, and it happens um, very quietly. And then I think there should be support for young women who speak out to, to um, get people and hold them accountable and responsible for the actions for anyone who engages in, in sexual harassment. Um, stereotypes against women in the legal profession. I had a, an interesting conversation the other day with a, a, a judge of this division who said to me, and he must be late 50s, probably early 60s, round about there. And he said, I don't know where the women my age are in the profession. And unfortunately, as I was trying to search my mind for who do I know who is sort of, you know, 55, round about there, um, and perhaps leading up a commercial law firm as a woman, it was very difficult for me to think of a particular example of someone that I know, um, because I think what we need is we need strong woman leaders in senior positions. And we have, for example, in the Legal Practice Council, many of the senior people in the Legal Practice Council are women. But I do think it is important that when, when it gets to um, directors and managing directors of law firms that there should be women and they can be mothers and they could be non-mothers if there's a thing like a non-mother then um, so that so that everyone is adequately represented and that people are able to um, look past the fact that it's a man's job and rather see it as it's a job for the person who would like to do the job and who is capable of doing the job, regardless of whether it's a man or a woman. Um, and that is not necessarily something that I think one could just um, snap your fingers. Um, I, I do think what it does require, um, Tinashe, to get back to your question uh, regarding stereotypes is for, for women to remain in the profession. And I know that sometimes it's really hard um, for whatever reason, for whether it's for personal reasons or whether it is for, um, for, you know, choices that you've made, particularly in your private life that, that leads you to, to have to step out of perhaps the commercial framework. But it is for women to remain and to remain in those positions and to set the tone to address any stereotypes. And I think I will leave it at that and um, hear what young women thinking about the legal profession or the law have to say. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. I think that was so, so informative um, and so insightful. And I think also you very much highlighted the, the existing stereotypes um, that we face during this era. And I think more so it just also takes us back as um, a woman being in leadership positions and the kind of expectations um, that also come with that. But I think also something that really stood out is when you said taking care of your physical health. I think it's so important and we take for granted how important your physical health is uh, when it also comes to your mental well-being. I think um, that is something that we recognize because like you're saying, 
um, we won't remain this age um, for now. So thank you so much, Prof. That was very, very uh, profound. Please don't forget everyone to type your questions for our speakers um, on the chat box, and then we will also have a Q&A in the end. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. I will now move on to our next speaker, um, who I'm very, very excited about, which is Shiletelo Mabasa. Shiletelo Mabasa is a master's student with the School of Journalism and Media Studies at Rhodes University. This budding journalist has been marking her mark in the world of reporting by taking up both leadership and team member roles in several student news organization across the print, across the print, digital and radio platforms. Her work has been published in prominent publications such as the Cape Argus and um, the South African. She firmly believes that media practitioners have a responsibility to advocate for social justice in addition to performing their roles to inform, educate, and entertain. It is this passion for combining media and advocacy that led to her passion and her answer for call of leadership by campaigning for the position of Rhodes SRC Media Counselor for 2020, to which she was elected as part of the university's first woman majority led student representative council. Very, very excited to have you here personal friend of mine. Over to you, Shiletelo Mabasa. Shiletelo. Are you with us? Can the technical team just check if Shiletelo is still with us? Please unmute. Oh, okay. Oh, Shiletelo is just saying that her screen froze. Okay, I think... Um, Shiletelo is just having some challenges. I think that in the meantime, we can move on to the next speaker and we can have her as our last speaker. Let me just uh, move on to the next speaker. Apologies about that, everyone. Our next speaker, so very excited, is Unati. Unati is a Makanda born young professional and a three time Rhodes University graduate. And a three time Rhodes University graduate with qualifications in industrial psychology, de developmental studies, and business management. She's also an Investec Rhodes awardee, a Yali South, Southern Africa Regional Scholar, and a GradStar SA Top. Um, 500 candidate with extensive community and youth development experience from repu reputable organizations such as Rhodes University Community Engagement Division, the Nelson Mandela Children's Fund, and the Uyine Nkwekiana Foundation, the Chikululu Chiku Social Investment, and the Raphael Center. With career aspirations in program coordination and project management in the NGO, private and public sectors, she's passionate about fostering leadership in young people and capacity building through providing access to opportunities for growth and skills development. She's also actively seeking experience where she's able to serve while nurturing her own professional and personal growth as a role model to her peers. She's currently working in Santon at the AB in 
Bev South African breweries, assisting with organizations dream to of bringing people together for a better world. Wow, wow, what a profound bio. Um, over to you, Ms. Unati. We are so excited to have you here with us as one of our speakers on the topic of women in student governance. Thank you. Good morning, Lebo. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I hope everyone can see and hear me. Um, I think just before I start, I'd like to introduce myself and just to add on to what Lebo has already mentioned. I am Unati and I am a very proud Rhodes alumni. And yeah, I was in the SRC in 2018. And I just like to take you through that journey so that you understand a bit more about me and my experiences within student governance. So when it came to running or rather the decision of me wanting to run and contest in the SRC elections, it was a very easy decision for me because I was running under the community engagement portfolio, which was something I'm very passionate about and it had been something I had been involved in since before my university days, since high school, in fact. So it was a very easy decision to make until I actually saw who I was running against. And it was a man, of course. And so as the campaign period went, I just felt more and more anxious and nervous about my decision and whether or not I wanted to actually carry on running and contesting for the actual position. But I actually stuck it out. And although there were some instances where I felt as though my running did not feel legitimate, such as when I actually passed a dining hall, um, predominantly male, and I heard them looking at me and then looking at my campaign poster, which was outside the dining hall and going, oh yes, I'm definitely voting for her. She's so pretty. Which for me felt as though that was the only reason that people would actually be voting for me and not because I actually deserved the vote. So when it actually came to inauguration night, I was very nervous, um, mixed emotions. And when I actually won my election and got inducted as community engagement counselor, for me, it felt as though like I had overcome a lot, not just as someone who wanted to be a part of the SRC, but also as a woman. And yeah, it kind of made it a bit political for me. And I was very proud to be part of my council because the top three were female. And this is very um, noteworthy because in the previous year, um, the top three were all males. They were all male candidates. And when it came to my council, I think we were one of the first SRC councils to be predominantly female. And that was also met with a lot of um, content um, emotions from the student body, which we would be serving. Now you have to remember that the student body that you serve is full of people from different backgrounds with different worldviews. You have people there with sexist mindsets. You have people who come from predominantly uh, patriarchal homes and backgrounds. And you also have people who just didn't want to vote for you because they don't like you be it male or female. So it's a very tumultuous space, which we have to maneuver in a kind of um, very careful way. And I think this is more the case when you are actually a woman, because already you're expected to fail on different levels, such as, oh, she's a girl, so you probably won't see in the office at some times in the month. Oh, she's a girl. Um, so probably even when she goes to meetings, she'll be late because she wants to look pretty. And so many other things that I heard in my year in the SRC. And this was for me more of the case when I actually had to rise up and become the secretary general of my council. This was also a contested decision because already the top three had been um, female um, until uh, SG actually had to resign. So it was a matter of, do we really want another woman to be in the top positions, in the executive positions? 
And after a bit of debate, um, it was decided that I would be. And again, of course, I felt the pressure of having to work twice as hard as anyone else who would have filled the position because I was a woman. And I think other reflections on my SRC journey would include just from the moment I actually decided to run and I had to go into the SRC offices to fetch um, forms for running, just as you walk into the SRC executive office, the pictures on the walls are predominantly males. And that's more and more reason to actually make you feel as though you don't belong. But yeah, that's just a brief history about my time in SRC, um, other spaces where I have served um, in some capacity as a student um, leader would also be Roos, um, Rhodes University Community Engagement Division, um, which, as I said, um, was my portfolio to begin with. And so even there, you wouldn't really expect it, but there is a bit of contention when it comes to gender and representation. Because um, when I was active in Rus, my competition or people who I always felt um, the need to outperform or prove myself to um, would be predominantly male, people like Oman Lake, Osanele, Theos and Adams. So just even maneuvering through that space in order to do something that you're actually passionate about ends up becoming a fight or more so political. But yeah, um, and so I just like to get started on some of the barriers and challenges which are faced by women when it comes to representation within student governance. I think the first one um, would draw on just the experiences that I also shared um, about uh, Rhodes University as a microcosm of broader society, basically, and also just draw upon my personal experiences in the SRC. So Rhodes, yeah, um, as a microcosm means that all of the stereotypes, all of the attitudes towards women, as well as women's capabilities are more concentrated since we live in a bubble in a smaller space. And so this means that how you maneuver the space is actually um, quite important as when we actually look at the top management of Rose University, we see even within the councils and other um, strategic bodies within the university, how male dominated they are. And you even see this when you actually go into middle management as well. And we only seeing recently um, more and more women actually contesting and becoming successful candidates for these positions. And I think this also leads me to my second point, um, which is about prejudice and just the idea of gender roles, especially for women, because um, through socialization from when you're actually born in the various institutions that you become a part of, such as your family, first and foremost, um, your schools, your churches, um, wherever you actually go and become a part of that community, there's always these preconceived ideas as to um, Uunati should be doing this, Uunati should be doing that. I know my mom wanted me to become a nurse because that's what most women in my family actually did. But <laughs> obviously that did not happen. Um, and there's also these preconceived ideas which also don't necessarily come from society, but ourselves as well. In terms of when I look at the woman in front of me, I feel as though I should be going in the sort of direction in terms of my career, in terms of my academics or whatever it may be. And so these ideas become enforced on us um, on a daily basis because um, like I said, it all starts with your family. So now when you actually go into the world with all of these mindsets, then it becomes a lot to deal with, especially when you're trying to maneuver spaces where you have to represent people with so many different um, interests, which also might be in contention with your own personal ones. Um, I think another important thing, uh, I think also I felt a lot 
when I was a student leader would be imposter syndrome. And it's not really something that goes away because even now when I'm part of a multinational organization, there's always questions in my head sometimes is in, do I belong here? Do, am I adding any value into the space? Do they really need me? For example, you know that if you were to resign or um, to die, for example, you would be replaced within a few days or a few months within your positions. So there's always these feelings of inadequacy or feeling insecure and not actually believing or trusting your own source. And it always delegitimizes your professional and your, your personal capabilities because there's this fear of not being good enough and overlooking your past achievements as well as what actually got you to where you are. And I think this is something that um, other student leaders also face. Uh, it'd be something that's interesting to actually hear about from the current council, which is also predominantly female. I actually don't know why they called me here today because I believe they're more than capable of speaking on this issue. But yes, um, this also leads me to something which women have been facing, talking about, and trying to tackle for years and years. I think even before the women in the 56 marches and the women who wrote books such as Bell Hooks on feminism, and this is the glass ceiling. And this is a resistance to efforts of women and minorities to reach top ranks in society. Because if I were to ask, um, what would the world look like if global gender equality goals were met? It usually starts at the top. For me personally, I believe it starts at the top because um, what you see is what you get for a lack of a better reference. Um, but in terms of who our leaders are, who sets the tone for the rest of society and who is actually within the governing structures of society is how actually any place is run. So why I say for me, the glass ceiling would be um, best looked at from the top down is because um, that's exactly where women are trying to get to anyway. And so when it comes to this, I think it's a very, it's a very multifaceted issue. As I said, um, people have been discussing this topic for years and years, and I think it's still something that even today is actually preventing us from reaching our full potential, but something that we've actually been working towards and against. And I think also um, this is where it comes in that the higher you rise, um, you should also be lifting up others. And this is why, again, I speak about top ranking um, members of society, because more and more we see women actually um, fighting against one another or looking at each other as each other's competition instead of actually helping each other. And I think this is a mindset which also builds into what society currently looks like, because um, you have a few women at the top just for representation's sake, but you're not really reaping the rewards at the bottom because even some of those women are actually fighting against getting more women into such structures. And yeah, I think also um, this comes to the notion of political versus personal and just acknowledging that our existence is actually political and embracing our intersectionality and always showing up as our best selves in the spaces which we occupy. Because um, I think, yeah, um, we have a tendency of thinking that, okay, I'm entering a board meeting now. So I need to have the sort of persona on in order for them to take me seriously. And I think this is actually um, the opposite. Because if we actually showed up in spaces as ourselves, and instead of trying to outshine one another, and actually um, assisted one another and lifted each other up. This is when we truly see and get to appreciate the sort of um, merits and um, work which women actually um, present or value which they add into spaces which they occupy.
And I think, yeah, now I just wanted to touch on two quotes, um, which I believe are quite impactful when looking at female representation in its broad um, manner, and also just um, looking at the intersectionality of women and issues faced by women within society. And the first one is, we are the ones we've been waiting for. And if not now, when? If not as who? And I believe this is quite powerful because we always have this notion that, oh no, I'm not strong enough. No one's gonna hear me. Um, no one understands me. But I'd like to believe there's actually more that unites us than actually um, divides us. And thanks to this, I think there's so much to appreciate amongst us as women. And these are the same qualities that we should be using in order to penetrate such spaces as student governance. And the second one is, here's to strong women. May we know them, may we be them, may we raise them. For me personally, I'd replace strong with resilient. Um, because the issues we face on a daily as women require so much resilience or rolling with the punches that we often have to, we have limited time to actually um, be strong, but rather being resilient means that no matter what actually happens, you keep going because that's what matters in the end. And also I would actually emphasize on the last part of raising women not only in the maternal sense, but also through the power of mentorship, sisterhood and partnerships amongst women. And I think this is very important as at the end of the day, a candle loses nothing by lighting another candle. And that's where I would like to end. And I'd like to thank the SRC for inviting me to share some of my experiences within student governance. And I hope all the ladies have a fantastic Women's Day. Thank you. So much that Unati, I myself greatly, greatly enjoyed your presentation. I and I very much think that you have touched on so many key things and drawing on your experience, I'm just trying to gauge how we still very much still experiencing the same um, stereotype and these very much normative roles in society that women are subjected to play. So I very much think that there's a greater process that needs to take place in terms of debunking these notions that exist in our society and very much more so like you were saying it's all in terms of understanding that is it's um within ourselves and also think and also just going back to the education system that has to come for that from that and the means of awareness because i very much think that everyone coming from a different background will assume that while well, this is a woman's role to play in society and those things very much need to be debunked. And thank you for that. And we are the ones that we've been waiting for. Thank you. Um, I will now move over to Sheila Taylor, who will be our last speaker. And we will then have a question and answer session in the end. Sheila Taylor. Is Sheila Dillo still not with us? If I can just get a director from the technical team. I'm here. Oh, okay. <laughs> can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, good morning, everyone. Happy Women's Day. Um, I'd like to say Happy Women's Day because our womanhood and our personhood is something to be celebrated. Although I must admit that there have been many times throughout the years where I have felt pretty disconnected to this day. And I think that that is something a lot of women can identify with. I think a lot of women of not feeling connected to Women's Day. But today I feel quite at home um, sharing this platform with fellow women and 
to be here and to be invited to engage um, by our very capable majority women leaders. It's so important to revel in these moments and to celebrate the little things and the big things I think is one of, um, I think that th this moment is one of those really big moments. I will be speaking and media in itself is a very broad term. When many of us hear the word, we often think about news media and journalism, but it can also refer to books, television, um, art, pretty much anything that is a text that you can read that communicates a message. Journalism, my chosen profession, is something that receives a lot of negative attention and criticism as an underdog profession. But if it were not for journalists, there would be many simple things that we take for granted that we would not know. Things that we, um, for example, possibly even the name of your very own presidents uh, that were reshuffled recently. The media are the fourth estate and they act as our window or gateway into the higher structures of our society, whether it's the government or simply the nuances in the structure of our society. A lot of the negative traits that are associated with the news media, such as gossip mongering or sensationalism or even embellishment, are associated with the way that women communicate. And these are ideas that are very dangerous because there is a history of women not being seen to crimes perpetuated against them. And if the news media is feminized and in this negative way, then there is a tendency to not want to see the news media in itself as credible. Now, with the prominence of social media, many journalists have not only been catapulted to celebrity status, but they've also become more accessible to their audiences. This does have significant drawbacks in addition to some advantages because journalists are exposed to online harassment. And this harassment also extends to the workplace. And so the conditions for doing journalism can be sometimes very difficult to bear. And harassment is common for women journalists. And I remember a footnote in some prescribed reading that I did when I was an undergrad that mentioned that it was very common, and I'm going to um, put out a trigger warning for um, mention and intimidation. Um, again, it mentioned that they were, it was very common for uh, women investigative journalists in particular to receive threats of rape. And not so long ago, you might have heard that the, the late Karima Brown was allegedly subjected to rape threats and death threats, and she actually took this matter to court. Across the pond, a viral video circulated that showed the sexual harassment of a US reporter. And she was working on the field, and this incident was captured by her cameraman before she went live with her news channel. Legal journalist Karen Mon who received death wishes after tweet, tweeting about her COVID-19 diagnosis, went, came out of hospital and decided to tweet about how grateful she was the vaccine was able to minimize her symptoms. So she effectively used her own experience to fulfill her duty as a journalist to inform people. So quelled the vaccine conspiracies that came out as a result Journalists also endure harassment on behalf, on behalf of their employers. If audiences are not fond of a particular media title, then some of that harassment extends to the journalists themselves. This knowledge can be used as a tool for intimidation against journalists. And journalists who are part of marginalized groups are vulnerable to these threats. It is a threat to our person, to the personal safety, so a major threat to media freedom. It is a threat to an intimate form of access that we have to the higher structures of government. It is a threat to our access to vital information. It is a threat to our basic constitutional right to know. 
When we look at how we can even begin to think about a way forward, we should look to understanding patriarchy and its impact on our society. Women are socialized to be careful and to second guess their decisions as the previous speaker mentioned. And that causes them to grow into adults who are not as confident as their masculine counterparts, even in certain cases where they might be more capable or even more qualified. If I can speak to my own experience, even writing my bio for this webinar, I kept asking myself if I was embellishing my achievements too much. I wondered if I need to scale down what I had what I'd written. I didn't allow myself to celebrate my achievements. I still question whether or not there would be someone who would read it and scoff at the idea of me achieving this or that, thinking to themselves, she's not nearly as accomplished as she thinks she is. And so it's important to realize that even the barriers that exist for us as individuals, as women, engineered through our schooling and our upbringing, our environments nurture our specific ways of thinking about how we as women should behave, and we continue to make internal assessments as to whether or not we are following that particular script. It's important to remember that unlearning is not something that happens 100%. You don't auto delete all of the years of indoctrination that you have suffered after reading one seminal feminist book. The indoctrination continues to linger as a specter, stalking us even while we try to uplift ourselves outside of that restrictive thinking. And I cannot talk about women in media without talking about how women are represented in the media. Sometimes we make the mistake of assuming that because a marginalized group is behind, uh, a marginalized person rather, is behind the camera or taking charge in a specific area, that the representation will be better or will be appropriate. But that is not always the case. And sometimes it is actually disheartening that people sometimes perpetuate the systems that oppress them. That is why unlearning is for both the privileged and the marginalized. So although it is impossible for us to completely rid ourselves of ontological violence, what matters is how we fight against that indoctrination and how we make every effort not to pass on those beliefs to the next generation. This is exactly why constructive criticism of the media is so necessary, because we should anticipate that people are going to make mistakes, and we should call on them to take responsibility to ensure that they they work around any of the ingrained biases that they have, and not only should they strive to know better, but it's also the responsibility to act on new information once they have received that useful critique. It is really important to assess how far people have come from the point of receiving that criticism. Even if we are uh, reporting on violent crimes that are perpetuated predominantly against women and even in some cases men, the language that we use as journalists is very important because we should be careful not to perpetuate the dominant regressive ways of thinking about violence against men and women. Now, going back into another anecdote, I did doubt myself a little bit when I was um, thinking one day about how it's quite commonplace that when a story is reported about um, a young girl who has been subjected to sexual violence or rape, that this girl is referred to a as a 17 year old woman or an 18 year old woman if she is in that um, later age range of her teen years. But in cases where we are talking about how um, someone who is 17, 18 or even 19 has achieved something um, of a high standard, for example, maybe they were the top or they invented some sort of scientific device that is absolutely amazing and we can't believe that a child could think about this and that's the novelty. In those cases where the story is positive, their youth is emphasized and they'll say that a 17 year old girl came up with this idea. But when it is the instance where they have been victimized, now they are referred to as a woman. And I want you to pay careful attention to that language use because it is something that is ingrained within us because the implication there is that this young woman must take responsibility for what was done to her. 
because there is a narrative within our patriarchal society that it is victims that are somehow responsible for what is done to them. And so this subtle piece of language perpetuates that idea. But when women come in and they do something that is when young girls come in, they do something that is unexpected and they make these wonderful achievements, suddenly we start to infantilize them. And that brings us back to this belief that we don't see young women as being capable enough. Yes, it is true that journalists um, need to follow the guide parameters um, and the ethical parameters. But I think that these ethical standards need to be expanded to accommodate these subtle nuances in language. That bit of self-censorship that journalists inherently have, that they are trained to have one, when they are doing their work, is something that they should do a little bit more of and question more when they are doing their work. Because I do understand that there is um, towards people feeling that they are censoring themselves too much when they are on social media. But journalists are in a very different position and that it is their role. The ways in which we might be affecting the way that people think about things. So, it is something that we learn early in, in journalism that we tell people what to think about, but we don't tell them what to think. But inadvertently, the words that we use in our articles, in our broadcasts, and the choices that we make in our messages do influence people whether we like, the, like to or not, whether we intend to or not. Um, just give me a second. Something else that is um, equally important is um, uh, going back to what Kim, um, the, the first speaker mentioned about the LGBTQIA plus community is that the queer community are usually seen as an afterthought to um, a feminism and um, the fight against patriarchy. And one could even think to themselves that the fact that I am making this as sort of a last bullet point to my, my speech today is that I am also making it a, a bit of an afterthought in terms of how I decided to go uh, about my speech. But it is definitely something that needs to happen in tandem with fighting against um, oppression against women under patriarchy because it is by design that queerness and queer phobia are mar um, a queer marginalized as a result of, of patriarchy. That the, the idea of two men being in a, in a loving relationship implies that one of them is feminized because the, ide the patriarchal ideal suggests that a man needs to have someone to subjugate. That is what it's about. So it's important for us to be able to make these nuanced connections between um, a queer, queerness uh, between, um, and, and where these things come from, a more compassionate um, way of dealing with each other. And we are able to be more in tune with the work that we do as journalists. And I think this really brings to life a lot more of the work that we do and it, and it gives it more purpose. There was a time in history where the idea of a journalist uh, being a woman or um, an author being a woman or even a film director being a woman was considered complete not commonplace. Although the conditions that women in these industries work under and the type of criticism and the recognition that they get could do with a bit of improvement to say the very least. And often we hear people mentioning things like it's 2021, how could you still be racist? How could you still be sexist? How could you still be that? 
but we might think that time heals all wounds or time does away with all of this and that, but we can't wait for time or the clock to do the work for us. We are present in this moment and it is our responsibility to do the work in whatever time that we do have. To not imagine that we're going to have the rest of whenever to be able to do whatever we need to be active in we need to be active in combating against the injustices in our society and not waiting for some distant uh, um, descendant of ours to take hold of the, these matters to, to, to change the, the things that are happening in our society. Thank you. Wow, wow, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Chiletelo. Um, you know, I always tell a lot of people about how, you know, well articulated um, you are and you just spoke so eloquently and I think it was so insightful um, to just, even when you highlighted the issue of language use, it's something that, you know, I didn't even ever think about and I very much appreciate um, you honoring the invite to join us today and speaking on very pertinent um, issues. So, so thank you, thank you so much. I'm just going to allow for, um, I'm also cognizant of the time, for just two rounds of questions for our speakers. Um, we have been getting a few questions on the chat box and also then um, via Instagram. And um, if the speakers can just note these, this um, question is for Kieran. Um, it is, hi Kieran, how do we move um, beyond queer representation? It sometimes looks like queer people who are in leadership positions are expected to be activists. So how do we then move beyond um, queer people who are in uh, positions of leadership um, having to be activists simply because um, they are queer and is there an expectation like that? Um, I hope you've noted that question, Karen. And the second question, I'm just gonna go to the chat box. The second question goes to uh, Ms. Unati. It says, how can one overcome the assumptions people make about them and the work one puts in? Because sometimes people do not understand the work um, one does and therefore deem it as being unimportant. How, so how do you overcome situations where people think you are not hardworking when you're actually putting in the work but aren't really recognized for it? And the last question um, is for Prof Kruger. You have managed to do so well in your life. Your work has been inspiring. How did you find your passion and how did you know it was your passion? What guidelines did you follow? So we will just do those three questions for now. I'll start with Kieran. If Kieran is still with us. Okay, I'll move on to the second question for Unati. Hi, Lobo. Um, sorry, there's just a bit of issue with my video. So I will take this um, without it. Um, I think in trying to answer this question, um, it leads me to actually one thing that kept me going when I was in the SRC as community engagement counselor, because um, I don't know if you would have noticed in your council, but there are some portfolios um, which get taken more seriously than others. And for me, my portfolio felt very important because it is one of the pillars or cornerstones of Rhodes University itself. Um, and the saying which I always um, repeated to myself was, if your presence doesn't make an impact, then your absence won't make a difference. And by that, um, I mean that you need to actually 
get people to take note of you. It is your responsibility. If your work is important to you and you believe that you are making a difference, then it is your responsibility to get that out there. And I think you can do it through various ways. Um, for example, always being informed. So if anyone has an issue or question regarding your own portfolio, you know exactly what is happening. Secondly, adding value. Wherever you found your portfolio um, or whoever you work with, um, for example, I worked with Roos and adding value was always something that I seek to do. Thirdly, um, it's being truthful and genuine. The only reason why I even ran to be community engagement counselor was because I was passionate about it. And then fourthly, I would say keeping your word. Um, that is very important because if people know you as someone who says, they will do something, they will host a walk or march and actually does it, then it will be good for your reputation. And lastly, I would say um, being relatable. Um, as we serve such a diverse student body and so many different interests, I would say being relatable is very important and trying to cater for the different audiences which you are actually serving. And if you are relatable, it means that people actually get you, but not only get you, but also get your message because you translate it or communicate it in such a way that they also understand it and your issues also become important to them as well. Um, I'm not too sure if I have answered the question, but I hope I have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Unati. I think you've captured it um, beautifully. Over to you, Prof. Um, I wish I knew, eh? Um, um, I could tell you that um, the one thing is by trial and error. Um, I do think, though, I was um, a law student in the mid-1990s when um, the South African constitution was drafted. So that gives you an indication I'm almost as old as all of your grandmothers. But in any event, so I um, was a law student then and I was very passionate about what law could possibly do for change in our society. But that is um, one, that was one aspect. And then the other aspect, I think I was pretty much in my second year when I decided I wanted to be an academic. And um, now 20 odd years later, I think I may not want to be an academic, but so I think the point what I'm trying to make is you find your passion every day. Um, I know that I am enjoying my work and I know what I'm interested in, but I learn every day. And I think the moment you stop learning and the moment you stop being inquisitive about what it is that you are doing, then you've lost your passion for what you are doing. Um, at the moment, I, I'm, I'm learning about areas of law that I've never thought that I would be interested in, and I'm enjoying every second of it. So um, the, um, <clears throat> the reality is that I think never stop learning, reading, um, discussing with people interesting things that, that common um, interests that you share with friends or even with foes, <laughs> you can learn quite a lot from that. So, uh, yeah, I think um, that is what I would advise you to do is to never stop learning. Lovely, lovely. Thank you so much um, for that, Prof. I will move on to the last questions, um, which is beautiful people, happy Women's Day. This goes to Nati. Your accomplishments are astounding and your speech was profound. You mentioned gender equality, which is a must, but I'd appreciate if you could elucidate why it's a victory when women, when women of sort, sort of dominate in the offices as you have mentioned. So that's a question for um, Unati. And we have a question for Chiletelo, which is, how has being the SRC media counselor during um, the virtual context um, shaped the manner in which you um, look at media? Um, I'll start with you, Nati. All right, thank you, Lebo. Um, I think, uh, firstly, just a point of correction, not saying that women should 
dominate those spaces, but that it is important for them to be represented within all of those different spaces, um, sort of in governance, but also in broad society, um, because um, they need to be included. Women issues and women matters need to be represented and included in decisions which are made for society, because women are also part of society. And I think what is also important um, is the debate of equity versus equality, because what we are trying to achieve when we look at um, gender equality, we're trying to look at it as something, um, not just as a win for women, but as a win for the whole of society. Because when women win, it means that societies are built as women are the actual people who give birth to people, um, women have given birth to leaders that we look up to nowadays. And they are the ones who actually groom and shape the leaders that we are also seeing today. And so if the issues are represented and if we're seeing them more and more in these spaces, then it'll show that spaces are actually acknowledging them as well as their role in society. Thank you, Unati. Um, Shile Delo. Is Shile Delo still with us? Um, can we allow Shiletelo to unmute? Um, thank you. I just want to confirm the question was about um, how uh, the pandemic caused me to rethink my role as media counselor, correct? Yes, correct. Okay, perfect. I love this question very much. Um, you know, it's interesting because doing media is something that involves um, you know interacting with other people but from the very beginning I was prepared to completely rethink um, or rather significantly rethink how I would handle the media counselor portfolio I'm a dreamer so I wanted to go big um, but of course when the pandemic happened um, I didn't want to diminish any of the dreams that I had. It just meant optimistic, um, which is very um, healthy for that kind of situation. So what that meant is that my role would actually become that that it than it was would usually be under normal circumstances because there was a lot of reliance on my office um, for us as the SRC to communicate our messages um, to fellow students. So I had to get very creative. I had to think of, um, you know, um, fixing historic problems with um, our emails, for example. There was an issue where whenever we'd send out emails to students um, through the regular systems that people use to send to student news, for example, that the emails would sometimes not arrive because of et cetera. And so I had to find ways to actually go and speak to someone, to speak to someone, to speak to someone, to fix the problem so that in 2021 and also in late 2020, I could send as many emails as I needed to without having any barriers got to have a lot more fun with what we got to do. And it meant that we as the SRC got to basically be invited into the homes of our fellow students and they got to see us um, more so that we, we were able to develop a very intimate relationship with them as members of our student community. So it means that there's a lot of opportunity there. And I think that just looking at what happened in, in my year and what happened with these as well that also had to get creative. Um, 
a lot of inspiration can be taken for what is happening in um, what is going to happen in the future. Because I did notice when I was, you know, assessing our social media and how we handle things that there were so many gaps because when we were in person, we relied, of course, on word of mouth and on using traditional means but now this really pushed us into a corner where we had to think about how else are we going to get people interested in certain things um how are we going to get creative and so yeah there was a lot of aspects that i needed to think about but um also a lot of barriers of course because you know um the pandemic was a very new thing and there was still um this impression that it was going to pass within a few months so certain things that i might have wanted to do would not have been possible uh, or there might have been some hesitancy in terms of um putting uh you know some sort of financial backing behind it because there was an um a focus on solving other problems that were quite big at that time so I think that it really emphasized and it emphasized the importance of creativity. SRCs are really going to have to show their faces more to um, to their to, to their fellow students, and I think it really um, elevated the importance of my portfolio. And I'm really happy um, for future media counselors to be able to enjoy um some of the fruits of the more positive elements sit back and look at where we can improve with online communication yeah thank you so much um for that Sheila Tello. i think it was just um so profound and yeah just an incredible way to just relook during this time um, in terms of basically when it comes to student governance and leadership, we are in a time period where we are literally reimagining um, different institutions that we find ourselves in. And one of those also then being leadership within the SRC. So thank you so much. Once again, I would just like to thank all our speakers for joining us today, for taking your time on um, Women's Day to be a part of us on this very, very insightful um, webinar. We celebrate you and we are so thankful for the contribution that you continue to make um, within our society and that we see you and we recognize you. And um, I think like Unati has said that we are the ones that we have been waiting for. And I very much um, also think that it is so important that we use these platforms um, to also uplift and empower other women, um, you know, because I think it is so fundamental that when we celebrate women, that we support women, that we mentor women, because we are um, very much who we've been waiting for during this time period, and more so because it's so fundamental in the system that we find ourselves in, um, you know, something that I'm reminded of last year when everyone was and everything. And I'm just reminded of the fact that um, you don't need to be in Bogoto, um, you know, and all of um, the things that come with that. So I very much think that it is so important that we um, uplift each other as women and lift up other women because uh, we need to occupy these spaces and make um, our intersectional issues um, very relevant to where we find ourselves in. So those are just my closing remarks. Thank you so much to our speakers, to everyone that has joined the webinar. Thank you so much to my council um, for the work that you've put in. And I hope that each and every single person enjoys the Women's Day. We will um, send you our banking details if you would just like to take it a bit extra um, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Um, let us continue to fight the good fight. Thank you, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of your day.